Emmanuel Velikovsky believed that the planet Saturn was once very near the Earth. So near, in fact, that when the giant planet exploded as a nova, water and or hydrogen from the explosion enveloped the Earth, causing the flood of Noah. According to Velikovsky, Earth was likely a satellite of Saturn. Dave Talbot and Wal Thornhill, following Velikovsky's lead, have reconstructed what they call the polar configuration from the mytho-historical record. Talbot and Thornhill believe that there was once a congregation of planets at the Earth's North Pole. In this reconstruction, Mars, Venus, Saturn, and perhaps Jupiter were aligned along Earth's axis. Just a few thousand years ago, our ancestors witnessed a gathering of planets close to the Earth. In the beginning, the gathered powers were not seen as separate gods, but as the primeval unity of heaven, the perfect conjunction, or great conjunction of the Golden Age. One simple truth will change the future of science and our understanding of human history. The ancient sky bore no resemblance to the sky we see today. At times, there were plasma discharges between the planets called Birkeland currents. This formation was known as the cosmic thunderbolt. Earthbound viewers could see the alignment with the discharges due to its occasional displacement along the axis. The idea of a conjunction of planets is not new with Talbot and Thornhill. It is ancient and widespread. The best scientists of France at the time of the Black Death, citing Aristotle, believed the disaster was caused by a conjunction of planets. The Roman poet Virgil knew of an ancient alignment of planets. Virgil announced the return of the Golden Age, introduced by the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, that is, the Star of Bethlehem, in his famous Fourth Ecologue. Other civilizations, such as the Hindus, Arabs, and Chinese, talked about conjunctions of the planets, linking them with the beginning and end of ages and the changes of rulers. Today, we think of a conjunction of planets only in the sense of two or more planets in a general sector of space. But the ancients were explicit that this conjunction was a close alignment of planets along a straight line or axis. Mainstream science objects to the notion that planets can align along a rotational axis as proposed by Talbot and Thornhill. Of course, this is true in a Newtonian universe where gravity is the only force. However, 
we live in a universe largely governed by electricity. Electricity, a force orders of magnitude stronger than gravity, flows along linear patterns or transmission lines. Therefore, it is not surprising to find that stars and planets are aligned in a similar fashion. Science now knows that stars and planets are formed as Herbig Harrow objects, where newly created stars and planets are aligned along the rotational axis exactly as claimed by Talbot, Thornhill, and the ancients. Given that the ancient records are clear about the existence of the great congregation of planets and that scientific evidence shows that not only is such a formation possible but exists throughout the galaxy, we should expect that the scriptures and prophets would have something to say about such an important topic if it were historically so. Speaking of the calamities of the last days, Apostle Parley P. Pratt declared that stars, which was his word for planets, would fall to Earth. Pratt indicated that these planets are returning to Earth, having been broken off during previous catastrophes in Earth's history. These planets are to be joined to Earth, just as they had been joined to Earth in earlier times. But planets, some of which are vastly larger than Earth, cannot join through direct contact. So how will this be done? Philo Dibble claimed that Joseph Smith made a drawing of ancient Earth's appearance from which he then made a facsimile. Sidney Dibble, Philo's son, described the facsimile. Earth is the center orb. According to Joseph Smith, ancient Earth was considered a conjunction of planets. This would explain Elder Pratt's assertion that planet-sized fragments of Earth were broken off. He simply meant that planets, from time to time, were separated from the conjunction and propelled into space. When they are rejoined at the Second Coming, they will take up their original places in the polar configuration. Although Sidney Dibble called the connections between the planets land, Joseph Smith considered them to be spiritual connections and not physical connections. The spiritual connections likely referred to the giant Birkeland currents that extended between the planets, forming the original cosmic thunderbolt. Facsimile number two from the Book of Abraham also points to a conjunction of planets along a common axis. The planet Olablish had both the same revolution as Kolob and the same measurement of time. This means that both planets were in axial alignment, rotating at the same rate. Earth also belonged to the same order of planets, meaning that it too belonged to the axial conjunction. In fact, facsimile number two is a representation of the cosmic wheel one of the many variations of the polar configuration. This strongly suggests that the conjunction of planets described in facsimile number two is the polar configuration of planets of our past, and that the planets named in the description of facsimile number two can be identified with the planets of the polar configuration. If we compare what the ancients said about the planet Saturn and what facsimile number two states about Kolob, we find numerous exact points of correspondence, making it likely the two were the same planet with different names.
Parley P. Pratt claimed that not only was Kolob a governing planet, but that it was a sun. The ancients considered the planet Saturn, under numerous names, the primeval sun god, as David Talbot points out. Joseph Smith's drawing of ancient Earth depicted three planets in alignment along an axis. Joseph's concept of a triple planet formation is found in different formulations throughout the scriptures. The most well-known scriptural example of three worlds is the notion of heaven, earth, and hell. These three celestial domains are of ancient origin and are part of the scriptures from the very beginning. The Genesis account records that God created the heaven and the earth. In the Hebrew of Genesis, the heaven is in the plural, but the Moses account makes it clear that heaven is to be understood in the singular. As the earth was a planet, so was the heaven. Although there is no mention in the creation account of a planet called hell, it is recorded repeatedly in the Old Testament. The Hebrew Sheol is alternatively translated as hell, the pit, and the grave, but means underworld. The Lord himself mentions it when expressing his anger at ancient Israel at the time of Moses. Job contrasted the height of heaven and the depth of hell. The most famous usage of heaven and hell is that of Isaiah and his account of the fall of Lucifer. Jesus Christ recognized the three planetary domains of heaven, earth, and hell in his promise to Peter. He used the Greek word Hades to designate hell. Hades is the Greek mythological counterpart to the Hebrew Sheol and means either the realm of the dead or the underworld. Jehovah's commandment against idolatry included not making images of anything in heaven, in the earth, and in the waters below the earth. The waters under the earth was a concrete place which had things that a likeness could be patterned after. It was a planet like the heaven and the earth. A similar statement made to Moses in the book of Moses makes the planetary identification clearer. Obviously, there was something located beneath Earth at one time. Though this specific typology of three planets is of ancient age, the Lord continued to use it in modern revelation. In section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord commanded the saints to teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom. He used the same imagery of a heaven above the earth and a world below the earth as he had in previous dispensations. These three planets were not symbolic flights of fancy or nebulous concepts. Each component of the triad was identified, given a specific name and location, locations which were visible to the inhabitants of the earth. Heaven was always above the earth and hell was always below the earth. Another formulation of a three-planet system is the three degrees of glory, or more properly, the three kingdoms of glory. The three degrees of glory are actually worlds, which is another name for inhabited planet. Each degree of glory will include a planet or planets with beings obtaining that state of glory, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. The levels of glory are typified by the sun, moon, and stars. The heavens were also divided into three parts. Anciently, Moses spoke of both a heaven and a heaven of heavens. So did Solomon when he built the temple. The Apostle Paul believed there were three heavens, as he indicated in his second epistle to the Corinthians. The celestial kingdom itself will follow the same three-planet model with three separate divisions or worlds. 
Joseph Smith clarified Paul's claim of a third heaven, stating that there are three divisions of heaven and that the highest is reserved for those entering into the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. Whether it is three heavens above the earth, three kingdoms of glory, or heaven above and hell below, the typology of three planets in alignment figure prominently in the scriptures and the gospel itself. In one of his many cryptic parables, for example, the Savior likened the kingdom of heaven unto leaven, which was divided into three parts and hid within three measures of meal. If the leaven is the kingdom of heaven, and the leaven is divided into three parts, then so is the kingdom of heaven. The conjunction of three planets, with earth in the center, a planet called heaven above the earth, and a planet called hell below the earth, was only one phase of the planetary configuration Joseph called earth. We know that planets from the great congregation were, from time to time, removed and sent elsewhere. We also know that when he comes again, former members of the ancient earth will return. <laughs>